If you've literally ever watched the news or a presidential debate or engaged with, quite frankly, a lot of politics, you'll know that fear can be politicized. The idea that fear is political is pretty common, but I feel like a lot of the time the nuances of it are not sufficiently explored. So this video is going to be about those nuances. Welcome to Political Psych with Abby, a channel where we talk about politics and psychology, or in the case of this video, politics and neuroscience, because in my day job, I got roped into Tiang a neuroscience class. And so I've been thinking about the actual goopy bits of like the human brain for a while now, and I wanted to do something about neuroscience and politics. Now, if I was smart, I would release this around Halloween, but I don't actually have another video planned for right now, and I want to get something out. So just like pretend it's Halloween, because we're going to be talking about fear, risk, the brain, and politics. So there's this concept that's pretty prevalent in political psychology. You might have actually heard me talking about it on this channel before. It's called fear of a dangerous world. And it's basically the idea that some people view the world as a more dangerous or more hostile place than other people do. And typically, people who are more conservative on a variety of dimensions view the world as a more dangerous uh, place. They have more beliefs in a dangerous world. And that's very convenient because we could just be like, conservatives are scared and that's why they're like that. Well, I mean, that would still be an oversimplification, but it would be convenient. However, there's this pretty recent paper, and by recent, I mean, it literally came out last year, that is calling a lot of that into question because it turns out that it kind of depends on how you're looking at these threats. So... The older scale, the belief in a dangerous world scale, puts a pretty heavy emphasis on threats by commission. So those are sort of active threats and also especially on aggression and threats from strangers. So threats like uh, a stranger is going to break into your house and hurt your family. That's like one of the sort of prototypical threat ideas from the old belief in a dangerous world scale. However, it seems like conservatives may be more, more disposed to believe in threats of that type being common in their world, but people who are more to the left may be more likely to believe in threats by omission. And that can relate to things like neglect. So the idea that like, oh God, if I become poor, no one's going to look after me. No one's going to make sure I get food. That's a threat by omission. Now we can definitely go into which one of these beliefs is more realistic. Although that's sort of outside the scope of this video, but I just want to say that I'm not treating them as equally realistic. And for those of you who don't already know, I tend to lean pretty left. Uh, if you want to know my views on which sort of side of the political spectrum is more reasonable in what they're afraid of and what they're not afraid of, I would really suggest my most recent video on a political polarization that gets into that a lot more. This video is going to be a little less oriented around a particular political point and more oriented around just the science uh, because it was originally written as a talk for a neuroscience class. But don't worry, you're still special. There's still stuff I'm saying in this that I wouldn't say in class. The new paper is using a subset of the primals inventory scale, which is trying to really get at sort of core elements of the human psyche rather than the belief in dangerous world scale, which is the previous most common measure for measuring sort of who thinks the world is a scarier place. I would argue that it's not really worth like throwing out either scale, but if we're looking at who's sort of more overall afraid, I would definitely be willing to believe that the belief in a dangerous world scale is biased in a way that makes conservatives seem more generally afraid. And, and if you know this channel, you know I don't pull my punches when it comes to talking about conservatives. So if I'm saying that, take it seriously. So yeah, the Clifton et al. paper found that hierarchy beliefs are actually much more predictive of people being more conservative. That's not surprising. I think in my video on attitudes, I go into how beliefs about hierarchy 
do really tend to affect politics. We're not going to go into that a ton here because this video is about fear, but hierarchy can certainly be very scary. I do want to point out that if we're just looking at fear measured by questionnaires, it's probably not the best predictor of someone's politics, especially if we're looking at overall fear rather than fear of specific things. So why don't we go into something a bit more physiological? Let's talk about physiological fear responses, because I'm not sure it's possible to get a totally unbiased questionnaire. If you know this channel, you know I love a questionnaire. Basically, my background is in social psychology. There's a lot of questionnaires involved. I put a Likert scale on the save the dates for my wedding. But it is worth looking at physiological things here. This is the paper that originally introduced me to the idea that political attitudes vary with physiological traits, and it's conveniently titled Political Attitudes Vary with Physiological Traits. So basically what this paper did was ask people their views on a wide variety of political issues and then lightly bully their participants <laughs> um, with consent and ethics and all that, but they lightly bullied their participants. So basically they exposed them to frightening images like the spider or like a frightening noise. And then they measured their startle blink responses and electroconductance on the skin, both of which can sort of mean a bunch of things, but are pretty typical of a fear response. And what they found is people who are more sensitive to the fear-inducing stimuli tended to be more in favor of defense spending, capital punishment, patriotism, and the Iraq war. And people who were less sensitive to these frightening stimuli were more likely to support foreign aid, liberal immigration policies, pacifism, and gun control. So, you know, maybe the conservatives are the real snowflakes, huh? You know, they're all scared and stuff. Well replication didn't find significance. Now that doesn't mean that anyone involved is like a bad scientist or anything. Sometimes weird stuff just happens with um, participants or these were done a couple years apart. So maybe that contributes to it. But I think that that does mean that we have to take the previous result with a big old grain of salt. But I do want to talk about some variations in responses to aversive stimuli by conservatives and more liberal leaning people. So aversive stimuli are just stimuli that are unpleasant. Uh, so I'm not going to do it because I like you, but if I were to make a really annoying screeching noise right now, that would be an aversive stimuli. Or if I were to show you an unexpected disgusting, disturbing image, that would also be in line with an aversive stimuli. And that's more similar to what they did in this specific study. And then the opposite of an aversive stimuli is an appetitive stimuli. So that would be like an adorable picture of a puppy or something. But basically, people who are more to the right tend to pay more attention to aversive stimuli and less attention to appetitive stimuli. And then the opposite are, is true of people who are more left-leaning. And here that's measured a number of ways, but one way is via skin conductance, which is the same way that they were measuring fear in the earlier studies, but here they're using it to measure attention. It might seem weird, two different things being measured the same way. It basically has to do with activation in the sympathetic nervous system, but that's like way too bio for this channel. And quite frankly, I spent all last quarter dealing with things that were way too bio for me, so I am so done with that. There's this other article by Nash and Leota, and in that article, they either did or didn't expose people to an article about economic threat, about an economic downturn, and then measured their responses to hearing an unpleasant white noise stimulus. And conservatives were more responsive to it, but only if they had been exposed to the economic threat. If they hadn't been exposed to the economic threat, they were actually less sensitive. So. I think that this whole liberalism versus conservatism sensitivity thing is very sort of situationally dependent. And that's a really interesting and important thing to keep in mind. So I have a whole video about genopolitics. Uh, genopolitics is the connection between our genetics and our politics. Basically, the important thing you need to know for this is that people's politics tend to run in families, um, both because 
there are some heritable factors that influence our politics. And because a lot of the nurture based factors that impl- influence our politics are also relevant to families. So a lot of the best models for predicting someone's politics are actually just based off of knowing how conservative their parents are. Correlation in political affiliation does tend to be stronger between identical twins than between fraternal twins. Identical twins, of course, share much more of their DNA than fraternal twins do, which suggests that these factors that contribute to politics are heritable, not just based off of nurture. Okay, I'm only going to highlight one genopolitics study in any depth here. But before I highlight that specific study, we need to know what in-groups and out-groups are. If you've watched like any videos on this channel, you know what an in-group and an out-group are. But for those of you who are new here, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy you're here. And an in-group is a group that you consider yourself a part of. Like if you subscribe to this channel, you're in the in-group of people who are subscribed to this channel. And you should definitely join that in-group. An out-group is a group you don't consider yourself a part of. A lot of social and political psychology has to deal with people's bias towards their in-group and bias against their out-groups. And sort of fear and hostility towards out-groups are a very common pattern in social psychology. And it turns out that out-group fear specifically runs in families, and that does tend to correlate with conservatism. Phobic fear also correlates with conservatism and also runs in families. And there does tend to be more correlation between identical rather than non-identical twins on these factors. So we're seeing here that the connection between fear and politics may also be connected to heritable factors. So I'm not really a neuroscience person, uh, although I'm well enough for a fancy university that will never be named on this channel to trust me with helping to teach it. Importantly, though, the part of the brain that's sort of most typically associated with fear is the amygdala. The amygdala does a whole bunch of different things. A lot of parts of the brain have multiple purposes. It's not cut and dry. It's very goopy. The human brain is actually kind of terrifying in its complexity anyway. But the amygdala is a good place to start looking for a connection between fear and politics because the amygdala is very associated with fear responses in the brain. So does the amygdala actually vary depending on a person's politics? Well, there's a study out of the UK about how political orientations are correlated with brain structure in young adults. There are obvious differences between British and American politics. I've gone over that on this channel a bunch of times before, um, so I'm not going to go into it here, but they were measuring politics on a left-right scale, so that has a pretty strong connection to how we would think about politics in the U.S., so basically, they did MRIs, which are a way where you can sort of look at what someone's brain looks like. And they found that the right amygdala had more gray matter volume in people who were more conservative. Now, typically, having more gray matter in the right amygdala is correlated to being a more fearful individual, but it is correlational. And as I said before, the amygdala does a bunch of different things. So we can't quite just called conservative scary decats, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly not evidence against that. All right. The anterior cingulate cortex had more gray matter volume in people who are more liberal. And this part of the brain deals with uncertainty and conflict primarily. So that's not really so much related to fear responses specifically, but it does have a lot to do with how people are going to deal with a lot of fear-inducing situations. So I think it's important to keep in mind. And then we get to a study that I think is really cool that's called Red Brain, Blue Brain, Evaluative Processes Differ in Democrats and Republicans. So this one is an fMRI study. That means that they're measuring what's actually happening in different parts of the brain, not just sort of the static structure of the brain itself. Well, static is in anything in a living organism can be static. Your body is like changing constantly. It's, it's best not to think about it. It's very distracting. Basically, they're having participants participate in uh, low stakes gambling, something called the risky gains task. Having participants engage in low stakes gambling is quite common across neuroscience and psychology because it allows you to examine the way participants deal with risk. 
You can't have it be high stakes gambling because there isn't that much research funding. And then they're comparing fMRI data recorded during the risky gains task to not survey responses, but real world political data. They're, they're comparing it to how people actually voted in elections in California where the study was done, which I think is really cool. I love any study that, that looks at people's actual political behavior as a measure of their politics, because that's of course what actually matters rather than a proxy for what matters. I should mention that the actual behavior, the actual risk-taking behavior didn't vary in a notable way between Republicans and Democrats. We're just talking about the activation here. Republicans had more activation in the right amygdala, so that could mean some things to do with fear or anxiety, but the right amygdala also has to do with risk processing. So it's not at all surprising that it's active in this task. What's interesting is that it's more active in Republicans than Democrats. And then Democrats had more activation in the left posterior insula, uh, which is a part of the brain that deals with pain, interoception, uh, emotion related things, cognition and social processing. So it's a part of the brain that does a lot, but it might mean that Democrats are engaging in to, to risk oversimplifying a bit more self-reflection while participating in this risky task. And I think it's really interesting to look at how people are dealing with risk in a political context, because politics and political decision making, a lot of it is how we choose to deal with risk as a society. And so people thinking about risks, feeling risk fundamentally differently could be related to political divides. What's also really interesting about the study is that it was able to predict people's conservatism, which in this context is measured as them being a Democrat or a Republican, better than the parent model. So the parent models of just like knowing how conservative someone's parents are is usually able to predict their politics about 70% of the time. And then models that are just based off of brain structure, like the MRI one we talked about earlier are also about 70%. But this model that's talking about their activation during specifically a risk-taking task is 82.9% predictive, which is considerably more. So that's like very impressive. And that also suggests that risk specifically and how risk manifests in the brain might be very important to political thinking. All right, so those are both sort of older studies. So I wanted to bring in something a bit newer so this study is functional connectivity signatures of political ideology. And what this one did was basically a lot of fMRI data about how people's brains act during various sort of standard tasks that you have people do in fMRI machines a lot. And then they compare that with people's politics. And this study is very interesting in that it's very much more trying to develop a model that is predictive than it is trying to sort of explain anything. And it's doing a lot of very complicated things with math. But basically, they found that activations of the amygdala, inferior frontal gyrus, and hippocampus are the most strongly associated with political affiliation. So we do see here the amygdala consistently popping up as something that's probably relevant. Now, they're not saying here whether the amygdala is really having anything to do with fear, but the fact that amygdala activation significantly varied between people who are more conservative and people who are more liberal is sort of an important thing to note. So they also compared a bunch of their sort of models based off of various tasks with the parent conservatism model in terms of like how predictive they were. Uh, what's interesting is that none of their individual tasks were more predictive than parental conservatism, although some of them were pretty similar to parental conservatism in terms of how predictive they were. So those were things like affect, um, retrieval, that's sort of your ability to think about things that you've thought about before, like retrieving information, empathy, and rewards. So we are seeing that processing of risk and processing of emotion seem to be involved in politics from like a neuroscience standpoint. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And they also found that including all the functional connectivity signatures, so that's sort of all the patterns of brain activation, did help their model to be better than just a model based off of parental conservatism, which does suggest 
it's very worthwhile to be doing research of this type, looking at the brain, because it's it's showing you something that isn't just shown by how conservative the parents are. But it's also possibly showing some of the mechanisms by which these more genetic things may be acting upon people's politics. However, causality is actually not always clear. So you might think, okay, but people's politics can't change their brain. Well, we actually don't have a reason to think they can't. Almost everything has the potential to change the brain. If, if you learn something, something physical is happening in your brain. In some tiny way, this video might be changing your brain. If you don't sleep enough, something physical is happening in your brain. And, and politics is definitely, you know, patterns of learning, patterns of thinking. Uh, so that can definitely impact your brain. The reason it's showing you a London taxi cab here is that one of the most famous neuroscience studies about this sort of thing is a study where they determined that the hippocampuses of London taxi drivers differ from those of the general population. Uh, because London taxi drivers have to learn the full map of London and keep that in their minds. And they actually did studies also where they looked at London taxi drivers before and after their training, and their training physically altered their brains. Hopefully Uber and Lyft long term won't de deprive of some really interesting study populations. <laughs> um, essentially, if learning a map of London can reshape your brain, there's no reason to think that your politically driven media consumption or actions or even groups of people you associate with couldn't reshape your brain as well. Basically, the point I'm making here is a lot of politics is biological, but that doesn't mean that it's predetermined or that it's unchangeable. And yes, fear, or at the very least response to risk and to aversive stimuli, does seem to vary with politics. But it's nuanced. It's not so much that one side is more afraid than the other. But I think understanding these differences is productive. Now, I'm not one of those we should all just get along politically type people. If you've seen my other videos, you know that. But I do think that there's value in increasing understanding of different political tendencies, even if we don't treat all those political tendencies as equally valid. Not giving you a big like political takeaway here. I often do in videos, but this is really much more of a science one. So I guess the political takeaway is probably people on different bits of the political spectrum are probably processing risk and fear differently. So I would say have empathy for that, but it's not a reason to excuse behaviors that are evil, but possibly fear motivated, like something like racism, right? It's just sort of to help our understanding of each other, right? But understanding each other doesn't mean we always have to agree with each other or that no one's right. I hope that makes sense. Thanks so much for watching. Extra special thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. You should go join them if you want to support the channel and get your pet in the end credits of the video. And if you like the video, please like, comment, subscribe, watch another video, whatever you feel like doing. Bye!